Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Families are being warned to expect higher prices this year as the low value of the pound makes cars, clothes and food more expensive. It comes as figures yesterday showed that consumer debt is approaching levels last seen just before the 2008 financial crash. Let's take a look for you in more detail. Here we go. 2016 saw the highest level of new car registrations ever, 2.7 million new vehicles on the road but industry insiders have told Sky News to expect prices to rise between two and three percent that is within the next few weeks the increase in sales can in part be explained by the availability of cheap credit which has been the biggest rise in consumer debt in a decade the economy becomes very fragile when you have such high levels of household debt relative to income and growth and what that means is if there is a shock to the economy, so you know, if there is a rise in, in unemployment, if there is an inflationary shock, the economy is much more fragile and things could get you know, quite, quite nasty. So steps need to be taken urgently to, to support poorer households and to support the wider economy through investment by the government. And it's not just the price of new cars that's expected to rise. The oil price has increased, adding threepence to the price of a litre of petrol in December alone. Did you notice that? I bet you did. And the RAC has warned prices will rise again soon. Yesterday, the retailer Next warned that shoppers could soon be paying 5% more for clothes this year. Plus, there have been warnings from food retailers that the cost of our weekly shop will go up as well. You may remember the row between Tesco and Unilever over a 10% rise in a, uh, that was just a few weeks ago. But one personal finance expert told us that putting it all on a credit card isn't the answer. I mean, every time I log on to my bank account, I'm is a plethora of information there. Do I want loans? Do I want credit cards? Do I want overdrafts and things? So you're bombarded by it. So you can imagine there's a lot of people out there, if you are struggling a bit, who you end up thinking, well, hang on a second, I'll go for this. And you may not be able to get those 0% rates just because they're the headline rates doesn't mean you will necessarily be accepted for those. And while the Bank of England base rate has fallen to around a quarter of a percent, uh, credit card rates, bizarrely, over the last few months have been going up. And we're now looking at nearly 23% a year, which is the average credit card interest rate. We're joined by our business presenter Ian King who is standing by in our city studio for us now. Hello to you Ian. We were promised uh, all this sort of doom and gloom weren't we by the previous Chancellor. Is it finally coming to pass? Uh, you could say that, Kay. We're also specifically on the point of interest. The Bank of England has been warning about this for quite some time during their last uh, inflation report in November last year. They said that uh, they expected the con rate of consumer price inflation, which currently, of course, stands at around 1.2%, to rise to 2.7% in this year and next year. And that, of course, Kay, is well above the 2% rate that the Bank of England is mandated to target. Now, there are a lot of specific reasons. It's very easy. I mean, you, you, you mentioned the previous Chancellor there. And, you know, we had all this talk about project fear ahead of the Brexit referendum. There are a lot of other factors at play here as well, chief among them being the rise in oil prices. And that's got precious little on, of itself to do with the referendum and the outcome of it. The oil price, of course, has gone up from, you know, this time last year, it had a two on the front of it. Uh, earlier this week, we were flirting with $58 a barrel. And that feeds through to higher prices in all sorts of ways. And there is a double whammy compounded by the drop in the pound after the referendum because, of course, uh, oil prices are denominated in dollars, so we suffer uh, both ways on that. The drop of the pound has been a factor, of course. But if you take, for example, Next, yesterday they're warning that the price per garment could rise by around 5%. I mean, that's not only down to the fact that the pound has fallen, it's to do with a whole number of other factors. For example, the fact that there's going to be a revaluation of business rates. Uh, we've got the apprenticeship levy. You've got a rise in the national living wage coming through. You've got energy taxes. And Next, yesterday, said that that was going to add... 13 million pounds to their costs alone next year. They won't be the only high street retailer suffering in that way as well. OK, for now, thank you. Uh, joining us now is the personal finance expert, Gemma Godfrey. Hello to you, Gemma. How worried should people be? I mean, this is a big concern because what we've seen is a Christmas of excess and people are really waking up to credit card debt hangover with, you know, one in every three of us actually having funded Christmas with borrowed money. And the reason why there is...
cause for concern is, first of all, very few of us actually have a plan on how to get out of this debt, how to actually repay it. Um, secondly, even if they have a plan, the concern is if, if there's a change of circumstance, they might not be able to actually implement it. So, for example, if they, um, they get uh, made redundant, um, if their wage is cut, and most crucially, if obviously our costs of living continue to rise. And the final cause for concern is the fact that very few people have a safety net. Um, very few people actually have um, a, an amount saved away so that if there was a change of circumstance, they'd have something to fall back on. So picking apart what you're saying there, Gemma, we need to be particularly worried if we've, uh, take, if we've uh, spent Christmas on our credit card. Yeah, I mean, being able, spending money that you don't have, so spending money um, on a credit card, so it's obviously borrowed money, is a concern if they're, they're, either you don't have a plan to be able to repay it um, or you have this change of circumstance. So at the moment, what we're seeing is, is that because interest rates are so low, people are able to borrow cheaply. So there isn't a concern right now, which is why people have been so encouraged to, you know, it's been Black Friday, it's been Cyber Monday, um, there have been um, you know, these great sales online and people have really been motivated to, um, to spend money they don't have. But the problem comes in the future if the economy does struggle a bit, um, if people, you know, kind of change, change what's going on in their lives, etc. I mean, five and, a, five and a half million of us in the UK um, are likely to fall behind on our finances in January. So, you know, it does leave us vulnerable. What do we need to do? How, how can we help ourselves? Well, I mean, there are a few different plans that have been kind of floated around. For example, um, a few people have lobbied government to say, could there be um, a freeze? And actually, if people do fall behind on their finances, um, and for example, they, you know, they, they owe a certain amount of money, can they be given you know, a 12-month per grace period? But really, we do have to take it into our own hands. And the way in which um, you can do it is, first of all, to make sure that you have a plan. If you've spent money that, as I said, it's borrowed money, but have a plan on how you're going to be able to repay um, your credit cards and break it down into manageable steps. And really, ultimately, no matter what situation you're in, putting your money to work um, is very important because if you leave money in a savings account, it doesn't grow while your cost of living does. So unless you're investing some of it, um, being able to watch that grow as well, um, you know, that's the best thing to do uh, to protect yourself for the future. OK, good to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. The number of new cars sold in the UK hit an all-time high in 2016. The increase of more than 2% was mainly due to high demand from business customers. That's according to the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders. But sales are expected to fall sharply this year, as our industry correspondent John Moylan reports. Once, new cars were the preserve of the privileged few. Not anymore. These days we buy cars like mobile phones. The reason we're all buying so many new cars is because the industry makes it so easy for us. In fact, the vast majority of customers are now effectively leasing new vehicles for an affordable monthly payment, rather than worrying about the overall sticker price. Ivan Foreman used to buy cars second hand. Now he doesn't have to. All of the options that are now available with leasing and financing, you know, and can now pay less on a overall or on a monthly basis, but still you know, go home with a brand new car. You can probably now have a car like that for £10 a month more than your goal. This shift in how we buy cars is also changing the type of car we're buying too. There's a real trend for people to buy more upmarket cars because the monthly payments are usually not that much greater than buying a, a more mainstream vehicle. And people are very badge conscious and they want the latest technology and that's what these premium manufacturers are offering. Last year, total sales hit almost 2.7 million cars. That was up 2.3% on the previous year, which was also a record high. But the industry now expects sales to fall by more than 5% in the coming year. That's because consumer demand has been falling. It could get worse amid the economic uncertainty ahead. What's more, higher prices are coming to forecourts. The pressure that comes from a lower value power, to a certain extent, does help exporters, but the converse of that is it does make imports more expensive. Around six out of seven cars that we sell here are imported, so the pressure of that depreciation in sterling will undoubtedly flow through to price rises. The rising price of fuel won't help either. Petrol and diesel have hit an 18-month high. After five years of growth, the car market could be in for a bumpy ride. John Moylan, BBC News. 
And now to another sign of how the economy is doing. Britain's service sector grew at its fastest pace for 17 months in December. That's according to a survey published today. Services which cover everything from retail and transport to banking and accounting make up three quarters of the economy. Our economics editor, Kamal Ahmed, is here with me. Uh, on the face of it, Kamal, this is, this is good news. It certainly is, uh, George. As you say, the services sector is the largest part of our economy. It's very important that it performs well. This seems to be off the back of pretty confident uh, British consum consumers who are still out there uh, shopping. Um, Andrew Haldane, the chief economist of the Bank of England, was at an event today that I was at. He welcomed these figures. He admitted that the Bank of England, maybe last year before the referendum, was a little bit too pessimistic, that all the figures we've had on the services sector, on construction, on manufacturing, have been more positive since Britain voted to leave the European Union. But he did s uh, signal a note of caution and sound a note of warning. He said that this year and next year could be tougher. Because of the fall in the value of sterling, imports of food and fuel are likely to be more expensive. Those inflation pressures are pushing in to the British economy. What was interesting about today's figures, they said that inflation pressures in the services sector on the high street were at their highest since 2011. So those pressures will push through to higher prices for consumers. That could mean the economy could stutter in the future. All right, Kamal. Thanks very much. Thank you. Now, Britain faces a very hard Brexit, according to the Norwegian Prime Minister, who's warned the UK has a difficult task in negotiating its departure from the EU because it lacks the right experience. The criticism comes just after the appointment of Britain's new EU ambassador. Our political editor, Gary Gibbon, is in Westminster. Gary. Well, the government here was ready for all sorts of brickbats to come from the 27 countries that are staying inside the EU over the months to come. A bit of surprise around Whitehall uh, that the brickbats today uh, come from a country that isn't inside the EU. Uh, but Norway's Prime Minister, uh, Erna Solberg, has been saying that she thinks we could be heading for a very hard Brexit. That's a relative term, perhaps. Uh, Norway is in a position where it accepts the jurisdiction of the European uh, Court of Justice, it accepts freedom of movement. Those are two things which uh, Theresa May has been pretty clear Britain is not going to uh, accept. So uh, that might be her simply realising that we're heading in a, a certain direction. Uh, but it is also, of course, an echo of some of the things that uh, Sir Ivan Rogers was saying, the outgoing uh, our man to the EU, UCREP as it's called in the uh, uh, jargon, who seem to be hinting at that sort of problem in his uh, email to his staff. The other thing that the Norwegian Prime Minister is talking about is that she thinks that uh, Britain is seriously uh, understaffed and doesn't have enough people to do negotiations. Strangely, she says this has come up from Norway's experience. Well, a bit of puzzlement in Whitehall about that because we don't negotiate with Norway on trade because we are at the moment inside the EU. But again, it has an echo of the sort of stuff that uh, Ivan Rogers was talking about. And tonight, uh, the Financial Times is talking about a bit of power grab, power play going on in Whitehall. Another thing Ivan Rogers was talking about was the government hasn't been clear about who's in charge of those negotiations. And it seems there is still some backroom uh, grabbing of uh, land uh, attempts at that sort of thing to try and make sure uh, that certain people are in charge. The government has not been clear yet to officials who's in charge of those negotiations. Gary Gibbon at Westminster. And all the uncertainty over Brexit, how soon, how hard, how feasible, is one of the key problems facing British industry this year. Confidence and investment plans have recovered since the referendum vote, according to a survey of more than 7,000 businesses by the British Chambers of Commerce. Though costs are also rising because of the fall in the pound, our business editor Siobhan Kennedy has been to see one business in Daventry, where exports are booming but import costs are soaring too. Like many small businesses, this nutritional supplements firm in the East Midlands heard the dire warnings about Britain leaving the EU. They were nervous about the impact and braced themselves for change. But six months on, and touch wood, they say business has been booming. Brexit's had quite an impact on us, mainly because of the currency change, and that's meant that our overseas business has absolutely gone through the roof. We're seeing 76% growth in our overseas business right now, and overall our business is up 23%. I do feel sometimes that I'm riding a galloping horse. Of course, the flip side of a weak pound is that it's also more expensive for them to import the raw materials they need to make their products. 
The growth in sales has largely masked that problem so far, but some of her suppliers have insisted on price increases. They've come to us very quickly, almost immediately, with those increases, which has been quite a, had quite an impact on us. We're trying to sit on those costs and not pass those on yet, so we're hoping that things will change and we'll be able to maintain our current pricing strategy. Cheryl's story mirrors the findings of a survey today from the British Chambers of Commerce. Rather than the doom and gloom Brexit scenario, businesses appear to be holding their own. Those surveyed reported growing confidence about future growth in jobs, in investment in machinery and in sales. Given that your survey was very forward-looking in many instances, is it not time, do you think, to change your predictions for 2017? Which, I mean, should you not be upgrading that now, given what your survey has told you? Well, we, we, we are standing by our current projection of about 1.1% growth for this year. It's our belief that inflation is going to start feeding through. We've seen the leading edge of it with businesses in this survey saying that raw material prices are starting to affect them and it's putting pressure on them in turn to raise their own prices. We think that will continue. This product promises to give you a boost, exactly what many people said the British economy would need if we voted for Brexit. But if this business is anything to go by, the exact opposite is true. If anything, Brexit has given them a boost. But that's not to say they're not worried about the future and the perceived lack of planning for when Brexit actually happens. I'd, I'd like to see a plan. I'd like to feel that the government was really had a strong understanding of what small business needs in the UK. We're the major drivers of business in the UK as a small business. And I don't see that Brexit, um, the, our exit strategy is, is in any way clear. Instability such as Brexit or the currency is a real problem for small business. Brexit instability is bad for big business too. Yesterday, Next reported weak Christmas trading and said it would raise its prices by 5% to account for the falling pound. Cheryl hopes people's focus on health and nutrition will shield her somewhat. But if things don't change, she says, come the summer, her prices will have to rise too.